Dear Muslims, dear believers, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Hayya lillah. Hayya lillah. Hayya lillah. Hayya lillah. Allahu akbar. Allahu akbar. La ilaha illallah. That is, praise be to Allah, the guardian, evolver, cherisher, keeper, sustainer of all the worlds, of all of the systems of knowledge. We render all praises to him and we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness. We put our faith and trust in him. Mighty and sublime is he. I bear witness and give open testimony that there is nothing worthy of worship except the law and Allah alone, the one and only, there is none like unto him. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Allah's servant, messenger prophet, and guide to all of humanity for all times. We ask Allah's peace, his blessings, his highest exaltations be upon Prophet Muhammad, upon his family, his companions, the righteous all on us, O Muslims, be peace. Dear beloved Muslims, I greet you with the best greeting of As-Salaamu Alaikum. As-Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah. And what follows of this excellent salutation to our Prophet Muhammad, the prayers and the peace be on him. Dear beloved Muslims, dear believers, I advise you as I advise myself to fear Allah to have taqwa for Allah, to reverence him, have regard for him and his creation, and know that he is the creator of all. He creates, but was never created. We should fear God as he should be feared. Today, uh, brothers and sisters, the title of my talk is The Revelation of al fath or the victory, growth and development through plant life. I want to begin this by giving us some background on this revelation, al fath um, in, in Quran, it is the 48th surah. And it, by way of background, um, after the Prophet وسلم, and his followers had left Mecca and had established themselves in Medina, after about a six year absence, the Prophet وسلم, led 
anywhere, there are reports that it was anywhere from 14 to 1,500 of the faithful uh, to make Umrah uh, from Medina to Mecca. Um, but they never made it. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through Allah's guidance, took the caravan of believers in, in varying routes, trying to avoid the enemy, the enemies of Islam, uh, more specifically the Quraysh, who were at that time looking for an excuse, another excuse, to kill the Muslims claiming at the time that the Muslims were going to be their aggressors and then of course blaming everything on them in order to sort of wash their hands of the, of the slaughter. Uh, so the Quraysh had concocted this story that the Muslims journey to Mecca was really a ruse. Uh, it was, um, uh, they were donning pilgrim garb in order to trick uh, the Quraysh. Uh, that it was designed to make everyone think they were just peaceful travelers on their way to make Umrah. Um, and, and this is a little side note for those uh, who don't know, Umrah is what is considered to be the lesser Hajj. It's not Hajj. Uh, you perform the same rites as you do at Hajj, but it is not Hajj. Um, but the Quraysh claim that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and his followers, their real intent was war. So on these rumors, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam halted the caravan at Hutabaya, where a rumor spread amongst the Muslims that Khalid bin Walid, uh, who was a a fierce warrior of the, the Kurdish tribe uh, and who commanded a cavalry of over 200 horsemen was ready to attack the Muslims and wipe them out. And quite frankly, the Muslims weren't prepared for war. They had not come to fight. Um, and, and as proof of this, by Arab uh, tradition, because they were making the Umrah, because they were going to the Kaaba, even pre-revelation to the Prophet Wasallam, it was Arab tradition that whenever you went to make, uh, whenever you went to the Kaaba, um, you didn't carry weapons. Because, um, in fact, in in Quran, uh, Allah says, they ask you concerning fighting in the prohibited month. Say, fighting in this month is a grave offense, but graver is it in the sight of Allah to prevent access to the path of Allah to deny him, to prevent access to the sacred mosque and drive out its members. So this, this was, but prior to that revelation, it was already tradition amongst the Arabs that whenever they went to uh, uh, the Kaaba during these, because they had prohibited months as well, there was no fighting. So the, the followers of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they only carried, each one of them only had a single sword. So this was clear evidence that they had not come to fight. So thinking that his party was going to be annihilated, the Prophet Wasallam gathered the faithful under a tree at Hutabai, all 14 to 1,500 of them, and took a pledge, uh, uh, an oath of loyalty, <coughs> to fight to the death against Khalid bin Walid. And as I told you, there was a rumor that he was already headed there with 200 cavalry, which I mean, essentially means they were on horses, they had all the weapons, 
the, the followers who were in this caravan on their way to make Umrah only had a single sword. But under this tree at Hutabai, these some say 1,400, others say 1,500. You pick the number. It was over 1,000. And of those who took the pledge at Hutabaya, all of them but one pledged their loyalty to fight to the death at Hutabaya. And I think as a side note, I want to tell you that two years after this, Khalid bin Walid took his shahadat. He became Muslim. Shortly after taking this pledge, the Prophet وسلم, negotiated the treaty at Hutabai, where amongst other terms, the parties agreed to this. One, there would be no war or any other hostility, open or secret. It was to have been suspended for 10 years. Any Quraysh defectors to Medina would be returned to Mecca. But there was no reciprocation. So if you were a Muslim and you left Medina going back to Mecca to be with the Quraysh, the Quraysh had no obligation to return you to Medina. But if you were in Mecca, a member of the Quraysh, and you decided that you wanted to follow the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet was obligated to return you to Medina. That was in the treaty. The third thing that was in the treaty was that every Arab tribe would be allowed to choose sides and honor that same treaty. So that there were others, there were other tribes that existed in the Arabian Peninsula, and those tribes were allowed to choose sides. And whatever side they chose, they had to honor this agreement at Hutubai. And the fourth was, and this is why I told you earlier, that they never made it to Mecca. The Muslims would not be allowed to make Umrah that year. They would return to Medina and come back the following year. Now the interesting part, the little details, you know, they always say the the you know read the fine print. The details in Hutabaya was when the caravan was to come back the following year to make Umrah, the Quraysh agreed to abandon the city for three days. Everybody would leave and leave Mecca to the Muslims. That's just a little detail. And the Prophet وسلم, he accepted this. The companions, on the other hand, were disappointed. They were embarrassed, they were humiliated, and they were upset. Remember, earlier, they had taken a pledge to fight to the death. And now, many of them felt as if Many of them felt as if they were, what is, the, uh, what, what is it that we say? Um, they were returning to Medina with, the, with their tails between their legs. Just, they were just embarrassed. In fact, when you read the history of Hutabaya, you will also learn, and, and I didn't know this, that it was coming back from that journey. No, while they were still in Utbah, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered his followers to make sacrifice of the animals that they bought to sacrifice, and to then either cut their hair or shave their heads, which is a traditional part of both um Umrah and Hajj. And what I didn't know was, they refused to do it. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, told them three times, and three times, 1,500 followers who 
had just sworn their allegiance to fight to the death refused to do what the prophet said. And it wasn't until the prophet's wife, Sadiq, advised him to go do it, do it himself, and they will follow you. And that's what he did. He went out and made the sacrifice. He went and shaved his head, and 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 the Sahabas followed right behind him, and did as they were instructed. But on their way back to Mecca, Allah revealed to His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm sorry. On their way back to Medina, let me get that clear. On their way back to Medina. Allah revealed to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-fath, or the victory. Whereupon hearing it, the spirit of his companions was immediately lifted. Allah says in Quran, O Prophet, surely we have granted you a manifest victory in the form of a treaty concluded at Utabai so that Allah may forgive your past as well as your future sins, perfect his <coughs> blessings upon you, and guide you to the right way, and that Allah may bestow on you his mighty help. It was he who sent down tranquility into the hearts of the believers so that they may add more faith to their faith. To Allah belongs the forces of the heavens and the earth, and Allah is all knowledgeable, all wise. He has caused you to do as you have done so that, that he may admit the believing men and believing women into gardens beneath which rivers flow to live therein forever and remove from them their misdeeds. And ever is that in the sight of Allah a great achievement. And Allah the Mighty certainly speaks the truth. The last ayah of that sort, and this is what we're going to be focusing on today, because the the um, the the subtitle of this talk of the revelation of Al Faf of the victory is growth and development through plant life. So this is the last ayah of. Uh, Surah uh, al -Fat. and this is, that would be um, uh, Surah 29, says this, Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, and those with him are strong against the unbelievers and kind to each other among themselves. When you see them, you will find them making ruku, bowing down, and suju, that is prostration in prayer, craving for the blessings from Allah and his good pleasure. They have the marks of suju on their foreheads. That is, and for those who don't know, suju is the prostration. The traces of their prostration. This is their description in the Torah. And their description in the gospel is as a plant which produces its offshoots and strengthens them so they grow firm and stand upon their stalks, delighting those who harvest them, so that Allah may engage in rage by them, the disbelievers. Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds among them forgiveness and a great reward. Now, I want, I want to offer us some comments from Quran and Imam W.D. Muhammad on this passage and their description in the gospel is as a plant which produces its offshoots and strength, strengthens them so they grow firm and stand upon their stalks. Because this final ayah appeared in Alpha 
entitled The Victory. And in the very last ayah is where I started to see and draw a correlation between the victory and our growth and development through plant life. And then the last comments I want to make is with respect, and I've been trying to get to this for, for the last two talks that I gave, and I, I'm going to get to it today, inshallah. And that was with respect um, to what I mentioned uh, earlier, where in that ayah it says they have the marks of their prostration on their foreheads. And of course, some of you think that when it talks about marks, you have seen, in fact, um, in fact, when it talks about marks being on the forehead, many think when they read that, that it's talking about prostration. But as I look around the room, I don't see marks on forehead. Now, I have one on mine. And if you want one like this, I can tell you how I got it. Start making your salats on a wood floor. I'm talking about a wooden floor. See, we, when we come in here, we make it on carpet. Well, as I got older, I'm 65 now. As I got older, the only place I have carpet in my house is on the fourth level. If I'm down on the second level, where I spend the majority of my time, the third level is where I sleep. But if I'm down on the second level, at 65 years old, I'm not trying to trounce all the way upstairs just so that I can have the comfort of cover. And I had gotten this way over time, particularly after making Hutch. Because you're required to make your prayers, and of course, when you're when you're in Mecca, you're going to do all five of your salats and more. I mean, I stand <coughs> literally right next to the Kaaba. Maybe three city blocks to get there, and then you've got to walk the length of maybe close to three football fields before you even get inside. If that gives you some sense of how it's set up. But these marks, in fact, I've even, I've even known folk who to get like marks on their forehead, they wear very tight kufis. And if you look at most kufis, like this kufi I have on now, it has an edge to it. If you look at more, most prayer rugs, they have some brocade right on the edge. And every time you prostrate, if you're on a wood floor and then your forehead on that wood floor hits the edge of that carpet, it's going to create a mark. Plus, I can't speak for each one of you because we're different. I bruise easy. One of you could hit me in the shoulder today with your fist, and I would tell you within four to six hours, I'm going to have a bruise. I bruise easy. So me having a mark is no big deal. I can get a mark. There's been years that I haven't. Does that mean that I'm not praying? If I look at you and don't see a mark, does that mean that you're not offering your salats? No, that doesn't even make sense. Allah is not talking about the marks that you get. If you want to take it literally, yes. But Allah tells you in the Quran, some of what he says is allegorical. He says that in the Quran. And he says that some of you are going to take it literally. So, what, a month from now, 
If you look at me and you don't see a mark, what does that mean? I, I'm not praying no more. No, it don't mean that. What it means is, for both you and I, we need to mind our business. <laughs> it ain't none of your business and none of my business whether or not you making your prayers, whether you making them on time, whether you doing them in congregation or not, that is not my business. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was reported that a, a, a follower came to him and said that he saw so-and-so in his house drinking. And the Prophet asked him, said, how do you know? He said, I looked through the window and saw him drinking. The Prophet said, then you should have poked your eyes out. You mind your business. So it's got nothing to do with that. And, and you can go to larger masjids and see hundreds of Muslims. All of them don't have a mark. They're praying or not praying? And that ain't our business. But here is what, here is what, here's what Yusuf Ali says. This is, this is a part of his, um, this is the uh, uh, part of the notes that you will find about this particular. The traces of their earnestness, excuse me, the traces of their earnestness and humility are engraved on their faces, <coughs> i.e. penetrate their innermost being, the face being the outward sign of the inner person. Isn't that true? When, you, when we see each other, what's the first thing that you see? It's this face. And if you see light coming from this face, if, if you see humility, if you see joy, if you see earnestness come from this face, because for sure, if you see my face and it's all frowned up, you're going to all you're going to come and say, is, is there something wrong with But when you when we look at each other and we see the light of Allah through our faces, those are the marks that Allah is speaking of. Because it's not possible for a man or a woman to offer his prayers daily, sometimes even, even uh, um, um, performing more than what is required of him or her. It's not possible for you to offer those prayers and that, that, that sense of humbleness and that sense of humility and earnestness and, and it, it, it's not going to show on your face. That it's not going to show through your actions. Could you see any one of us with a mark on our forehead standing up at the gas station arguing with somebody that, that, that got in front of them in line? And you and, and you you on your way to Salat al Juma. And you argue with somebody on the way. You just got finished making Salat and you fighting with your wife. Or she's fighting with her husband. You just you just wasted about ten minutes doing something you could have been a little bit more productive. But when you do this with some constancy and consistency, it's going to show not only on your face; it's also going to show in your behavior. It's also going to show how you interact with others, both strangers and those that you know. So, when, when that passage talked about, let me make sure that I got it right. And their description in the gospel is as a plant which produces its offshoots and strengthens them so they grow firm and stand upon their stalks. This is telling us that our life, that is the life of the human being, both scripturally and literally, is like that 
of a plant which produces its offshoots and strengthens them so they grow and stand upon stalks. Now, let's assume for a moment you're not a believer. You're a scientist. You, 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 know, you know, God may be this, he may not. But when you read this, your scientific mind is going to, to, to ask you or say to you, well, the human being, man in scientific terms, is called a homo erectus, meaning this is a man who's now standing straight up. As he, you know what erect is. Well, the human being in scientific terms is considered to be a homo erectus. And when we perform salat, now this is on the, this is on the spiritual side. When we form salat, can you imagine yourself bending like a plant in the wind? And don't we, in every movement, don't we return to Kian? Standing straight up like a plant. There's no difference. And so we're in this upright position. I'm telling you, God knows what he's talking about. He created us. He knows us. In fact, Allah tells us that he created the human being weak. It says so in the Quran. But out of this weakness, this frail human being who was created from a fluid despised. Shaitan, Iblis, saw the creation of the human being. And every time he walked by Allah forming this human being, he would spit on us. He'd spit on you and me. This was Adam. The law was forming Adam. And every time she, she well, he wasn't Shaitan. Every time Iblis would walk by, he would spit on man, on the formation of man. And so when, when we talk about, and it says in Quran, uh, calls it a fluid despise. Allah showed us how to gain the strength with the right type of nourishment, and nutrients, the, the, the water that Allah says in Quran, everything is created from. He tells us in Quran that, that uh, the, the success comes whether you get a, a lot of water, and then he says, but even light moisture will do. So we don't have to always, we don't always have to be in, in, in blessing mode. There are going to be trials. There are trials with plants. I mean, how many times have you been walking down the street and you know, or walking across someone's yard or in a garden somewhere and you stepped on a plant? Our life is like that. It's not all blossoms. There ain't all, there's not always a rose at the end of the bush. There's a bush, but you can't see no flowers on it. It ain't that time yet. Allah says this in Quran. What is the matter with you that you do not regard the greatness of Allah when he has created you in gradual stages? Can you not see how Allah created the seven heavens, one above the other, placing in them the moon as a light and the sun as a glorious lamp? Allah has caused you to grow as a growth from the earth, growing gradually. And in the end, he will return you to the same earth and then raise you back to life again on the day of resurrection. Allah has made the earth for you as a wide expanse.
so that you may walk in its spacious paths. So once again, like a plant, Allah has created you in gradual stages, yet we have no regard for his greatness. And like a plant, Allah has caused us to grow from the earth gradually. Right? So, so I want to make a comment on that, and then, and then I'm going to sit. In its description, where it says Allah has made the earth for you as a wide expanse. Some interpretations of that ayah says Allah has made the earth for you as a carpet spread out. And When just colloquially, particularly those of you who are from this region, whenever you see green grass that's been freshly mowed, and maybe it just finished raining, you know, you look at it, and I've heard people say, I've said it myself. That carpet looks, that, that grass looks just like carpet. When it's, you know, evenly, evenly cut, you don't see no weeds, you know, you don't, all, all you see is just green grass. Particularly, like, go to a golf course. When they get on what they call the green, that green <coughs> is meticulously kept. And it looks, in some cases, some of these greens look better than carpet in my own house. But when Allah says this, this wide expanse, Allah has made the earth for you as a wide expanse so that you may walk in its spacious paths. I don't know what you all know about botany, about plants. But let me tell you something about a wide expanse as it relates to plants. When you go and buy a plant from a plant store, it comes in a pot. If you want that plant to grow, you have to take it out of that pot and put it in a larger pot in order for it to grow. If you don't, if you keep it in the pot that it's in, it is eventually going to choke itself because the roots can't spread out. They only put them in the pots that you find at the store so that they can sell them to you. They intend for you to take that plant home, put it in some kind of potting soil or, or plant it in the earth itself. And the bigger the pot you use, the bigger the plant is going to grow. My wife asked me about a plant that we've had, I think it's called a FICA tree. We've had it since 1984. And she wanted me to put it in a bigger pot. And I told her, I said, if you put it in a bigger pot, it's going to grow bigger than what you want it to. I wish you, and I did what she asked me to do. And now she sees. It got bigger. And every time I turn around, she's moving that plant, trying to find a place where it's going to fit now. Because it's bigger. And it's going to keep growing until it reaches its limit in that pot. We're like that. If you can find us, if you leave us in the pot in which we came in, you're not going to grow. You're going to be choked. You're going to end up right where you're going to end up. You are the same place today that you were yesterday. Nothing has changed. Because you're stagnant. And you can't help it. And I'm not talking about anyone personally. In fact, I'm not talking about anyone here. 
But when you go outside of these doors, or when you get back to your neighborhood, look at the people that you see every day that are doing the same thing today that they were doing last year. No different. On the same corner. Wearing the same clothes. Participating in the same behavior that they were participating in when they were in high school. Now they're 30, 40, 60 years old. And no growth, no development. No one bothered to take them out of that little pot that they were in and put them in something so that they could be able to appreciate the wide expanse that Allah has created here on earth. We don't have, we don't have an excuse. Allah just hasn't blessed them as they, as he's blessed us. So I hope this is, is um, making sense to us. Because Allah says in the Quran, from the earth did we create you, and into it, it shall we return you, and from it shall we bring you out once again. Let's pray for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbi Ailami. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم. So now, real quickly, this is the the revelation of Alpha, the, the victory, uh, growth and development through plant life. Imam Muhammad had. Uh, uh, said this, and, and he, he, he framed this in the form of a question. He said, when you put a seed in the ground, does it come forth immediately? He said, the ground can't deal with it immediately. The ground has to wait for the right season, and then the nourishment has to come gradually to the seed, and in time, the seed burst forth and shows what was hidden under the cover of the seed. Is that right? A corn plant, an oak tree, an olive tree, a tomato vine, is that right? In time, their seed burst, burst forth and shows what was hidden under the cover of the seed. He goes on and says, do you think your mind is any different from the earth? That everything that goes into your mind, you must understand it and get everything in as soon as it goes into your mind? And then he answers his own question, no. So if a plant does not produce itself right away, if a plant takes time from, the, from a seed, to grow and develop, we cannot as human beings be in such a hurry to become a plant before we go through the gestations of a seed. To have that seed crack, because seeds generally come with a covering. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Or sometimes you don't even recognize it as a cover, it just looks like a seed. And that applies to any seed, whether it's a flower, whether it's a vine, it doesn't matter. Now, some seeds are bigger than others. If you eat avocados, big seed. Watermelon, smaller seed. There's even, in Quran, there's even talk of the mustard seed. And that's, that's tiny. That is tiny. Even, in fact, when you, when you get a, when you get a, uh, like a jar of mustard seed, the holes in the top are not as large as the holes you'll find, say, in, in parsley or in some other crushed up herb because the mustard seed is so small that if they use bigger holes, you'd have to be real careful as to how you would use it. 
He goes on to say that don't reject things. Let it come into your mind and it will grow. And when the right environment comes along, the right season comes along, it may, because it, it may be too cold for it right now, it might have to warm up a little. Sometimes the season is too wet. Too much water hurts too. But when the right condition comes, the life that is there will come out. So don't be afraid of knowledge. Don't be afraid of Quran. Read it, study it, commit it to memory if you can. The more you take in, the more you will read. Now it was interesting to me that when 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 I read these these uh, a few comments from uh, from the imam, he talked about things being in the the right season. He said the the ground can't deal with it immediately. The ground has to wait for the right season. He he says. Um, uh, Let it come into your mind and it will grow. And when the right environment comes along, the right season comes along. Um, so he mentions that. And it reminded me of something that I've heard Christians say. So I did a little research and I found this in, in the Bible. And this is from um, uh, Galatians 6, 8 through 10. This is what God says. The one who plants the seed to please his flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But the one who plants the seed to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. If we do not give up, if we do not give up, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to the family of faith. Now that's from the Bible. We believe in all the books, right? That's, that's part of our articles of faith. I've already talked to you about Quran. I've already talked to you about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I already talked to you about the tafsir of Imam W. D. Muhammad. Now I reach back and got something else that I thought was good. That speaks directly to what we're talking about. There are many things in our religion we don't know. We should learn them. But none of us are going to know it all. But you come to Juma to be taught. To be reminded that the greatest thing on earth is dhikr Allahu Akbar. There's nothing else greater on the face of the earth than the remembrance of God. Nothing. And everything that you do, you should remember Allah. And when you forget, you should remember Allah. Everything, I mean, that just, anything that we normally take for granted, I got in the habit of doing it. If I'm about to walk down the steps Generally, a house, you'll have 13 set of steps going from the, you know, one floor to another. Count. That's like a industry standard. In fact, I think the industry standard is after 13 steps, then you got to create a land. In a, in a, in a um, like in a building. Because you want to give people a respite. You know, you, I mean, could you imagine you having to climb a thousand steps? And there's no time for you to break off and just and just rest. <laughs> right. So 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 it, it's it's when when I'm about to descend the steps, I don't know if it's going to be my time to go or not. Whether they're your steps, the steps here, my steps at home. Before I go down them steps, I say Bismillah. When you put money in that charity box over there, it's Bismillah. You on your way home? I mean, that. In fact, we don't have the time to do it here at Juma, but there are a whole series of duas that you make when you leave in your house, 
when you're coming back into your house, when you're going into a meeting, when you're leaving that meeting. When you study your religion, you'll find those things. And the more you study, you'll be able to commit those things to your mind. You may not be able to remember them word for word, but Allah is not going to reward you word for word. He's going to reward you on your intention. So you step into a meeting and all you say is Bismillah. You don't go through a whole process. It's the intention that you have that you're going to be rewarded for. And don't, don't nobody have to know it. It's not like you've got to say it out loud. You don't need a megaphone. You can just say it right here. That's sufficient. And you've completed your obligation. When we go to the bathroom, it's pissing me off. If I'm in the bathroom and I see you in the bathroom, I don't give you the greeting. I don't. Others do. Now, if you're in a place where there is a, in a bathroom where there's a separate voodoo station and you offer me the greeting, I'll return it. In fact, I'll give it to you. But if we're in a bathroom, like the one right here. And you standing there with the door open, don't greet me. That's a private place. That's where you take care of your business and you leave. Ain't no time for you to bring the newspaper and get the jet magazine or bring your phone into the bathroom and you know, checking your emails. Because you might check one of them emails and first thing you see is Assalamu alaikum on the email and you sitting on the toilet. Huh? One of you send me a text. I'm in the bathroom. I'm reading it up. This me up. Huh? While I'm on the toilet. Study your religion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had just come from how, what they described as the offices of nature. We, we call it the bathroom there. And the followers <coughs> were waiting there for him to come out so that he could make voodoo. Prophet came out, washed his hands with a little water, and went off and read the rain. Now, before I read that, Each and every time before I would go just read an ayah, I would make sure that I was in Wuda. Prophet didn't do that. Now I'm sure that was just one little instance. I don't want anyone to take that to say, you know what, man, I ain't got to make no Wudu. Yes, you do. You ain't the prophet. Prayers and the peace be on him. You can't do what he do. Prophet had more than four wives. You and I were restricted to four. He had more than four. Why? Because he was the prophet of God. His messenger. You can't do that. So you've got to, when you study your religion, you've got to study it with some degree of intelligence. Everything don't necessarily apply to you. He's there as an example the best example, but an example nevertheless. It's something for us to live up to, to try and achieve. Now, I have gotten in the habit that when I leave the offices of nature, I make wudu. And I do it so that when it's time for salat, when it's time for prayer, I don't have to wonder. So now I've got into a habit of doing it. I pattern my brain that when, no matter what I've done, while I was in there, if it wasn't to go in and take a gusle or take a shower, I'm going to make wudu before I come out. Then when my alarm goes off and tells me that it's time for salat, I don't even have to think anymore. It's done. We need to get into that habit.
So, by obeying the law, by deliberately and earnestly making all of our salats, eventually it will make you act and feel like a different person. You, you're gonna, you're gonna find, you're gonna find yourself putting you in check. Never mind somebody else. The more you study this religion, you're gonna be compelled to put yourself in check. You're gonna be compelled, even if you have to say it to yourself over and over again, brother, that ain't right. You could have handled that a different way. How would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with that particular situation? So before you go out and post your stuff on social media, you need to think about it. You know, give it some thought. How is somebody else going to respond to this? Maybe it's not right. Maybe you want to write something and just hold on to it. Don't send it out till the morning. Ain't nothing that time critical. In the end, you're going to feel stronger eventually. It's not going to be all of a sudden, although that would be easy for a lot. So in, in Quran, you know, Allah says we are like plants in terms of our growth and development. And like a planted seed, you, you don't spring forth all of a sudden. But it's through time and patience and proper nourishment and the proper nutrients that the plant, which is you, will start to grow and develop. And in the case of us as human beings, not only will you grow and develop, but you'll also make Progress. And I want us to remember this. Change is inevitable. It's going to happen. These children that are here now, tomorrow they may not look like they do today. The change is going to be inevitable. But your improvement is optional. You can change and not improve one iota. You change it and, and there'll be just the, you can change, but there won't be there'll be zero improvement. Yeah, you look different, but you're still acting like the same jerk that you were <laughs> a month ago, a year ago. And we gotta be mindful of that. Just because you decide to change all of a sudden, everybody else has to catch up to you. They all have to catch up to you. So if you were a person who at one time was in the filth of the muck and the mire and you were cursing and carrying on for 30 years, and Allah turned your life around, and you became Muslim, you took your shahada thing and you became Muslim. If you were 30 years acting like a cold-blooded fool and you change one day, how long do you think it's going to take the people that you came up with over those 30 years to recognize your change? They're not going to come as quick as you think they should. But no, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't want to in, in, invite Michael or... or or, or Mikhail or whatever he's calling himself now. Because every time he come over here, all he want to do is fight. Well, you ain't fighting no more. But people remember, when they remember you, before you took your shahada, you was just known as a head cracker. A fight. Every place you go, you disrupt everything. You got to give people time. They got to be able to respect the new you. In all instances, and you're going to find the devils amongst them, the jinn amongst them, they're going to tempt you. They're going to try you. In little subtle ways, they'll slide up to you and say, 
You remember that time you and me hooked up and blah, 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 blah. Law tells you what to do in that situation. You just walk away. Wish them peace. And you keep stepping. Our dear brother Muhammad Ali, may Allah forgive him his sins and grant him paradise, said this, the man who views the world at 50, the same as he did at 20, has wasted 30 years of his life. And from the Quran, Allah says, Know that the life of this world is but amusement and diversion and adornment and boasting to one another and competition in increase of wealth and children. Like the example of a rain whose resulting plant growth pleases the tillers. Then it dries and you see it turn yellow. Then it becomes scattered debris. And in the hereafter is severe punishment and forgiveness from the law and approval. And what is the worldly life except the enjoyment of delusions? Akima Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu wa la ilaha wa Allah. Ashadu anu Muhammad wa Rasulullah. Hayyad al-Salah, Hayyad al-Falah. Katakamit al-Salah, Katakamit al-Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illa Allah. La ilaha illa Allah. Allah who had bar? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbi Ailmi. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yomidin. Iya kana badu wa iya kana stain. Iden esorota mustaki. Surat Allah dina anda ilaihim. Gayuhu mandu bialaihim. Waladohi. Well, us in Nalin San Elaficus, Illa Latina Amin, Amin who saw a hatty, what will soul be hock, what will soul be Sabbath? A law at war. Send me a law, Hamid. A law at war. Allah who had born. Allah who had born. Allah who had born. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi he had a number do a yak and nast time. It didn't sorrow to a mustaki. So that Allah did a hundred lame. And I grew mom to be a lame. Well, a door. Call who a law who are a law who are summer. Lamulet or lamulet. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرٍ سمي الله محمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله